So last video for chapter five, I just wanna remind you real quick, we said group one, excluding hydrogen, is the alkali metals. Group two are the alkaline earth metals. Groups three through 12 are the transition elements or transition metals. Group 13 through 16 are the main group elements. Group 17 are the halogens and group 18 are the noble gases. So we still have to talk about these two rows down here and hydrogen. So this row on the periodic table is a family called the lanthanides. So these do not have a group number. They're elements 57 through 71. So these are metals and they're similar to the group two elements or the group two metals. So they're less reactive and harder than group one. These elements were identified by Glenn Seaborg and his crew, his researchers, between the 1940s and 1950s. And these were once referred to as rare earth metals instead of the lanthanides because they're very similar to each other and they were hard to discover. Once they started to discover one, they realized that there were others, but it was hard to tell them apart. So people thought they were rare. They're not rare, they're just hard to find and hard to identify. So they changed the name from rare earth metals to the lanthanides. And now the question is, why are they down here? Why are they not a part of the periodic table? Well, the only reason they're placed below the periodic table is to save space. Okay, so they they fall right here. There's this like chunk with a star. That's where the lanthanides go. So number 56, barium, and then 57 to 70, and then up here, 71. So imagine if we put these in here, let me get my pen. If you put the lanthanides where they belong, it would make this part of the periodic table shoot the whole way out like this. Okay, that's a really bad rectangle, but so it would make the chart really, really long. So they just plop this whole chunk out and put it below. So these fall within period six. These are in period six, but they do not have a group number. So period six, no group number for these, but they do actually have a place on the periodic table in the periodic table. It's just that having them in their rightful place would make the periodic table super, super wide. So those are the lanthanides. And then we have this bottom row, which are called the actinides. So the actinides are elements 89 through 103. These were also identified by Glenn Seaborg and his research crew. All of the actinides are highly radioactive. Okay, uranium is found here, plutonium, neptunium, very, very radioactive. Once again, the only reason they are placed below the table is to save space. They belong right here. Number 88 is radium, and then 89 to 102, back up to 103. And francium and radium are pretty um, dangerous as well. So it makes sense that these kind of fit right beside them. Once again, just because if you didn't have them below, you'd have to put them into group, I'm sorry, into period seven, which would extend the periodic table. These do not have a group number. They are all in just period seven. So a quick video on the lanthanides and actinides. Welcome, you're just in time to learn about lanthanides. It's the, it's the periodic table of elements. It's, it's wonderful. You got your noble gases over here and hydrogen, the building block of everything in the universe over here. You got your alkali metals and gold and other lovely uh, regular metals in the middle here. But what is this? What are these elements that aren't in? They're not in the table proper. They're like in their own table. What makes you guys so special? Those are the lanthanides on top and the actinides on the bottom and they're down there because they can't be trusted around the other elements. That's not true. They actually could be a part of the table, but if they became part of the table, the table would be too big to put on a piece of paper. So they sort of shove them down to the bottom. Basically like Alaska. You always sort of like disembody Alaska and bring it down because it's just too big. You gotta, just, gotta, 
break it off. They are actually kind of crazy. Actinides are, uh, they contain all the elements that we make nuclear weapons out of. But the lanthanides on the top there, uh, they're actually responsible for a lot of the coolest things that we have as 21st century citizens. Laptops, cell phones, plasma screen TVs, solar panels, wind turbines, the catalytic converter on your car that makes your car not so horrible for the environment, and also the pollution control equipment that we stick on top of big, gigantic coal-fired power plants. All that stuff is made possible by our friends the Lanthanides. Yeah, rare earth elements for president! Oh, hold on a sec. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. No. No. Oh. Because our rare earth Lanthanide friends are so freaking awesome, of course, they have to have a dark side. Despite their name, a lot of rare earths are really common. They're called rare because they're hard to find in large concentrations. They, they, they like to mix together with a bunch of other minerals and elements underground. They're, there's never like a vein full of indium. So extracting rare earths and especially refining them is a huge pain in the ass. In addition to giving you a huge pain in the ass, refining rare earths also gives you uh, mountains of low-level radioactive waste. And I mean, who wants to deal with that? I'm actually gonna give you a second to think about who would want to deal with all that. Yeah, it's China. In the past 20 years, we've become extremely dependent on rare earth metals for our, you know, everything. And since none of us want gigantic piles of toxic waste dumped in our backyards, we've left about 95% of the processing of rare earth metals to Chinese refineries, which are hardly regulated at all, and in some cases just totally illegal. And believe me when I say that they're making an unholy, godforsaken mess over there. I'm talking giant, sizzling lakes of acidic waste. Oh god, I can't breathe. But the Chinese are also totally making bank off of all this, and they're also wielding a lot of political power. Like, if China got angry at the United States tomorrow, they could be like, No more neodymium for you! And then we wouldn't have any neodymium. Which would mean, like, no new wind turbines or, like, uh, high-powered electric motors for, for hybrid cars. So other countries, including the United States, have cautiously begun building their much more expensive, much cleaner rare earth refineries, probably just in time for the bubble to pop on all of this stuff. But we still have to figure out something to do with all of that toxic byproduct. Nobody's come up with a really good solution to that problem. Just recently, a rare earth mine in California opened back up after being shut down in 1998 for toxic leakage. But now the company promising that they, they've got it all figured out. No big deal. One of their solutions involves covering toxic wastewater pools with interlocked 18-sided plastic balls to prevent evaporation. Yeah, plastic balls uh, covering a radioactive sludge pond. I not filled with an overwhelming sense of confidence in that idea, but the state of California seems to be satisfied. 21st century problems, y'all. If you want to know where we got all the information for this episode, we've, we've set you up with some links below so that you can learn more about rare earth elements and all of the controversy and awesome things surrounding them. And you can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter. If you have any questions for us, you can also leave those. So the lanthanides are used in a lot of products and items that we find um, necessary in our lives. Unfortunately, a lot of their byproducts are toxic. And then, like I said, the actinides are just super radioactive. Um, the next video is very weird, but a lot of the lanthanides and actinides are named after people or places. So I just want you to hear some of the more extreme names that some of them are named. I did not make this video. It's weird. Fair warning. Oh, I'm so excited! You see, this next group, the actinides, is my group. I sit right here between fermium and nobelium. We're a pretty awesome group. In fact, we're what's hot. Radioactive hot, that is. Every actinide is radioactive, and that's made us famous. You might recognize plutonium from... Uh, yeah, that. And uranium, well, uranium is famous for... <laughs> yeah, he's had some meltdowns. Sure, thorium is more abundant and doesn't have the same potential for meltdowns, but uranium is still the star when it comes to nuclear power because... Well, just because. In addition to being famous, many of us are named after famous people and places. It's pretty apparent if you listen to our names. Laurentium, Nobelium, Fermium, Einsteinium, Curium, Americium, Californium, Berkelium. Some of us are even named after gods. Thorium, Plutonium, Neptunium, and Uranium, named for Uranus. Only Protactinium and Actinium get left out. All of us, after Neptunium, do not occur in nature. Instead, we have to be synthesized in a lab.
So as I said, cool names, a lot of names after gods or places or people. The little guy talking was supposed to be uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, Mendeleevium. He has his own um, element, Einsteinium, Curium, Marie Curie. So uh, a lot of important people and places. So that is it for our main families. But we have one element we did not talk about yet. What about poor little hydrogen? Okay, it does not fit into group one family because it's not an alkali metal. Hydrogen is a non-metal. So why don't we place it above group one? Why don't we just place it right here, randomly placed? So hydrogen is the only element that does not belong to a specific family. It is usually found placed above group one on the periodic table. And there is a reason. It's because the electron configuration, which you haven't learned yet, that's chapter four, the electron configuration of hydrogen is similar to the electron configuration of the alkali metals. So that's really the only reason they put it there because it's number one, one up, just plop at the very top to begin with. Sometimes, very rarely, you'll see it over here, placed above group 17. So hydrogen's number one, and then helium's number two. It can be placed there, and it has a good reason. It's because hydrogen is diatomic. Di means two, atomic means atom. So diatomic means these atoms are found in pairs in nature. They're like twins. And you'll learn that in chapter seven. So hydrogen is diatomic, and so are the halogens. So sometimes you see hydrogen placed above group 17, but most likely it's placed above group one. So it doesn't have a family, but it's still number one. It created everything. Without it, we wouldn't have the other elements. So that is it. That is chapter five, the periodic table, the history of the table, the types of elements, metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. And then lastly, the families of the periodic table and hydrogen. So just to remind you, once again, hydrogen has no family. The rest of group one are the alkali metals. Group two is the alkaline earth metals. Groups three through 12 are the transition elements or transition metals. Group 13 through 16 are the main group elements. Group 17 is the halogens. Group 18 are the noble gases. And then down here, part of period six are the lanthanides and part of period seven are the actinides. And that's it, that's all the families.